takes a whole village to raise a child. The origin of this popular saying is a mystery. Some believe it to be an ancient African proverb. Others believe it came from our First Nations. In 1996, Hillary Clinton's book, It Takes a Village, made the phrase popular. I cite the phrase as it truly conveys my experience growing up in Sunderland. The village provide a safe, interesting and nurturing haunt for a young boy. To convey this experience, I will call three days as an eight-year-old growing up in the village. A Saturday in mid-January, a Friday in May, and a Sunday in August. The year, 1955. A Saturday in January meant hockey. First thing, I'd be off to the rink. No ride or accompaniment by a parent. With the equipment shoved in my dad's discarded Air Force duffel bag and slung over my shoulder, I would head out to compete in a morning house league game organized by Newton Reed, the United Church minister. Rarely would the walk to the rink be direct. Often it included a stop at Mrs. Stan Miller's where I would drop off my weekly sports report. Mrs. Miller provided local news reports to the Lindsay Post. Any published report that I provided her returned five cents a columnar inch. If there was not a bond spiel in progress, a visit to the Sunderland curling rink was also a popular stop. Lloyd Bagshaw, the caretaker, always offered a chance to throw a few stones. After leaving my arena activities, it was off to the post office to get a ride home with my dad for lunch. My arrival at the post office usually allowed time to mooch a dime and slip across to Bob Young's grocery to buy a bottle of Wilson's soda. Always Wilson's, as it was 12 ounces in size as opposed to the 10 or 7 ounces of other brands. There might also be time to drop into the Bagshaw hardware store and visit with Elgin, check out the hockey sticks and have my skates sharpened. After lunch I was usually sent on an errand to freeze. My task might be to retrieve a package from our locker at the freezer or get butter at the creamery. I would always stop for a visit with Elwood or Donnie Brooks, who usually offered a sample of butter from the big wooden churn. In the remaining afternoon, it would be off to Lloyd Morrow's shop to hold court from the seat of the 35 Ferguson tractor on display in the front showroom. Alternatively, if mild enough, I might join a hockey game on the farm pond beside Bert Waddell's barn, just west of Morrow's, or possibly an afternoon of tobogganing on Doble's Hill, pictured in the introductory slide. As darkness approached, it would be time to head home in readiness for an evening at the rink. The ladies auxiliary of the Royal Canadian Legion managed the food booth at the Sunderland Memorial Arena. Typically, mother would work the booth while my dad and I took in a senior ORHA hockey game. Always a rollicking affair. The intermission between periods allowed a break to slip downtown to pick up a freshly baked round loaf at Old Fields Bakery and the Star Weekly from Anderson's Drug Store. Two special joys of Sunday morning. 
Generally, we would be home in time to catch CBC's broadcast of the last period of the Leaf game, after which I would head to bed where I could dream of scoring the winning goal in the Stanley Cup final. Of course, life on a May school day unfolded very differently. With a free hour and a half at noon, I would usually walk home for lunch, but Friday would typically be the day that Mother would go to Lindsay on a shopping trip. This allowed time to visit Mr. Jenkins, the bank manager at the Bank of Commerce. After writing an NSF check on my bank account, he had taken it upon himself to offer me some schooling on sound banking practice. As well, there would be time to meet Father at the Brock House for lunch. I have vivid recall of Mr. Shire, the proprietor, behind the beautiful hardwood bar that served as a lunch counter and graced the lower floor of the hotel. On the way home, there were lots of interesting places to visit. On the front hill, the blacksmith's shop, and across the street, the telephone exchange. The egg grating station was also an interesting spot. Perhaps a haircut at Lionel Gervais, or a visit with Jack Folladel. Very often, a stop to visit with Bill Clayton or Matt Copperthwaite at the General Motors John Deere dealership. People always seem to have time to chat and to share interesting information. If it was a day when Mother had the car, I would hurry home and join her in an uptown shopping adventure perhaps to Doyle's Lucky Dollar, and chat with Mabel Wright. Perhaps a chance to explore the interesting department store-like holdings of Taylor's Dry Goods. Maybe a friendly chat with Bryce McGilvery at Charter's Butcher Shop before picking Father up at the post office and heading home for supper. Sometimes a quick run home to grab a pole and head down the tracks to catch a trout at Slaughterhouse Creek. This could branch out to a visit to the train station and listen to incoming telegraph messages. <laughs> After supper, I would be busy attending to the many customers stopping at Joe's Bait for worms, frogs, minnows, crawfish, or leeches before heading on to their lake country cottages. I also have recall of a typical Sunday in August. Sunderland was on the weekend route for many Torontonians who would sit on the porch and watch the hundreds of cars creeping through town on the jammed highway as folks made their way back to the city. I am reminded that indeed I lived on Gasoline Alley with all the major petroleum companies of the day represented and competing for business. As well, the log cabin, operated by my best friend, John Glover's mom, did a thriving business throughout the Sunday afternoon and evening. Sunderland's Places and People were an integral part of my growth and development. I do hope that this brief presentation conveys my gratitude and many fond memories. <laughs>